uh, chapter there, I'd like to start and uh, focus on uh, verse number seven, where it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So, uh, verse 9 there, a lot of liberal churches twist this verse. When they say um, they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from, uh, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, they say that means hell is just a separation from God. They say that is the punishment. You just, you'll never be able to be with God. But really what this verse is saying, that is the source of that punishment. Hell is kindled by God's wrath. Um, just like in Genesis 2, 6, when it says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. It means that mist came from the earth. It doesn't mean it was separated from the earth, because if you read the second half of that verse, it says, Watered the whole face of the ground. If it was separated, how could it water the ground? It came from the earth, but it watered the ground. Just like the, the everlasting destruction came from the, from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, that's where it came from. That's not separated from. There's, there's a difference there. But these uh, liberal churches, they like to twist that. Um, and in verse 8, it says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that flaming fire, I think that's also talking about hell, but the primary meaning there is the flaming fire that when we get raptured up, that God is going to rain down fire and brimstone on the people that are still on the earth. That's the flaming fire it's talking. And it's going to take vengeance on those people. And it says, on which people? On the ones that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So does that mean we have to keep the commandments so we can get raptured up so we can get saved? No, it doesn't. In fact, uh, Romans 10.16 explains it. Romans 10.16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I say, Lord, who hath believed our report? So you can see, if they have not obeyed the gospel, who hath believed our report? So not obeying the gospel is not a, not believing it. And those people that aren't, aren't going to believe it, they're going to get that everlasting destruction. Um, so two weeks ago, I preached about the JFW cult, their Jehovah's False Witness cult. And those people, they believe there is no hell. All, all that happens when you die is you cease to exist. You just vanish into thin air, and there's, no, there's nothing that happens to you. And then, and then what we're just talking about now, a lot of liberal churches think that hell is just a separation from God. So if that's all it was, why do we bother going soul winning? Why should we bother warning people, hey, you might cease to exist someday if you're not a believer, or hey, you're just going to be separated from God. I mean, that would be terrible being separated from God. But that's not the bad part about hell. The bad part about hell is that it's fire and that it lasts forever. Like, this isn't just something that lasts for a few minutes and then boom, you're done, you're burnt up and you're gone. So, and that's why, why we go out and, and preach the gospel, because we want to save people from that. Because if that's all it was, let them take their chances. You know, they're not going to, if they're not going to burn, they're just going to cease to exist or, you know, or they're just going to be separated from God. Let them take their chances. But no, they're going to be burning in eternal torment. And so, so um, that's why we go and, you know, and knock and say, hey, if, if God forbid if something would happen to us right now and you, you both died, you know for sure you're going to heaven. Because we want them to know. Because if they are not 100% sure, they're going to hell. If they have 99% of their faith on Jesus, but 1% still on what they do, they're going straight to hell. They're going to draw their last breath on earth, and then they're going to wake up screaming in pain and agony. Um, so some people say, well, I'm, not, I'm still not convinced. I think hell is just separation from God. Turn to Psalm 139, please. And while you're going there, I'll uh, read from you from Proverbs 15, 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? So that verse is saying, hell and destruction are before the Lord. That means before means in front of. Hell and destruction are in front of the Lord. Like God can look into hell and see who's in there. In fact, the Bible says, I think it's in Proverbs 1, he laughs at the calamity. They didn't want to believe God before. He's laughing at them now. All those atheists that are in there and they didn't want nothing to, they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. 
God's laughing at their calamity. They had their chance to be saved. It's not that God isn't loving. He, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that, notice that love is love, past tense. So there comes a time when they reject God and either on earth they become reprobates or they die and they take their last breath and it's too late for them and God no longer loves them. Um, so if you're there in Psalm 139, look at verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yeah, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as a day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So David knew that he cannot hide from God. He knew, he said, Whither shall, shall I go from thy spirit? Or where, where shall I flee from thy presence? He knew that God's presence, he was om, omnipresent, right? That means he's in heaven and earth and hell at the same time. Now, a lot of people don't like, like to uh, think that God's in hell or that Jesus even went to hell. We know that Acts 2.31 teaches that that uh, Jesus went to hell. It says, well, actually, let's just turn there. So uh, I don't quote that to you wrong. Acts chapter 2. Actually, we'll start in verse 27. Acts chapter 2. Yeah. And um, I'll just read it for you first. Verse 27 says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did seek corruption. So right there we can tell Jesus went to hell to pay for our sins, to be a burnt offering, that the Old Testament burnt offerings over and over and over again was a symbol of what was going to come, that Jesus was going to be the lamb slain for us. And, and Jesus went to hell according to this. And this is actually, it's saying, talking about David here, that, uh, that David is speaking this. And this is found in, if you want to look a little more on your own time, Psalm 88 speaks a lot about this. Psalm 88, and this is quoting some of Psalm 88 here. That his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did seek corruption. So if Jesus went there to pay for our sins, how can we say that it's, it's uh, bad doctrine or, or, or bad uh, talking bad about God that his presence is in hell? He's, he's omnipresent. But anyway, that wasn't in my notes. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, so David knew that he couldn't hide from God, he couldn't run from God. I mean, Jonah tried, right? And, you know, we know what happened there. He got thrown overboard and a, a whale swallowed him. And that actually was a picture of hell because he was, of Jesus going to hell because he's in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, just like Jesus was in hell for three days and three nights. His soul was, his body was in the grave. And, and notice it also said, his, neither his flesh did see corruption. So his... His body did not rot away in the grave. There, three days later, his soul came in there, and it, it rose up. Um, so we we see that hell is not separation from God. But what is it? What is what is hell? You say, well, couldn't you have preached on something more pleasant today? You're going to scare the children. No. <laughs> First of all, most of the children here are mine, right? So, and and I want them to know that because. The young ones that are too young to understand salvation yet, if they understand hell, they know what they're getting saved from. Okay? So I, I'm not worried about scaring my children. And the thing is, some people say, well, can you do a 16-week series on love, right? You know, love, 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 love. Well, actually, hell ties in with love. If we love people, we'll tell them about hell, and tell them the gospel, and save them from hell. Right? So... But uh, obviously, like when we go into soul winning, that's one of the first things we, we mention to them, right? We, we need to get them to understand that they deserve to go to hell. And that the hell is a, you know, a place of eternal torment. 
But if we get that, we don't dwell on it. We move on to the next point. We talk about the gift of God as eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? So once we understand hell, we move on. So we don't dwell on it, but it is an important doctrine. Um, because if we understand how real hell is, we'll want to go out and get people saved. And that's why it's an important doctrine to preach. And some people will say, well, we don't save anybody. I don't like the way you said that. We don't save anybody. Well, Jude 20, 1, 22 says, and of some have compassion, make, making a difference. Verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So if Jude said, others save with fear, I have no problem saying save. Yes, God is the one that paid for it. But if we go and tell somebody, we're warning them, hey, your house is on fire, get out of there. You know, you're going to hell. Here's a free gift. Here's a lifesaver. Get out of there. Here's a, you know, get out of hell free card. Jesus paid for it. And that's why I got saved. That's why anybody gets saved because they're scared of hell. I, I didn't want to burn in hell for eternity. That's why I, I read through the Bible, asked Jesus, if there's something I, wrong, I believe wrong about the gospel, please show me. And he showed me, you know, through the preaching of Pastor Anderson. So, that's why we talk about hell. And yes, hell is a fire. Matthew 5, verse 22 says, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So hell fire, there's a fire there. And no, it's not just figurative, it's, it's a literal burning fire. Turn to Mark 9, please. While you're going there, I'll read for you a few other scriptures. Mark 9. So in Psalm 18, verse 5, it says, The sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. So it's not just some Abraham's bosom where it's a nice place. That's a false doctrine, but I didn't have time in here to talk about that in the sermon. It's, it's a place of sorrow. Why do you have sorrow? Why do you cry? Because something isn't going good. Okay? Sorrows, and in Psalm 116.3, it says, The sorrows of death can pass me, and the pain, pains of hell get hold upon me, upon trouble and sorrow. So there's sorrow, there's pain, there's trouble and sorrow. It's not just some happy place. Jonah 2.2 says, and, I, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried in on her is my voice. And that's talking about Jonah and Jonah's prophesying about Jesus there. He's talking about affliction. Affliction is pain and suffering. Uh, Luke 16, 23 says, And in hell, this is talking about the story of Lazarus and Abraham. He's, he's lying on Abraham, against Abraham's bosom. And the rich man, he lifts up his eyes. And in hell, he lifts up his eyes being in torments. And see if Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So if hell is just figurative, why is this man in torment? And so affliction is pain and suffering, but torment is severe pain and suffering. So not only is it torment, but it's severe. I mean, this rich man, if, if we look at the whole story, he wanted just a drop of water on his tongue. And, and the Bible doesn't say, but some people think, first of all, he maybe asked for like a whole wave of water to, to hit him, and then just a bucket, and then... You know, just a cup, and then just finally just a little drop, just to ease it a little bit. And no, he can't because because he is stuck in there, and nobody could pass over from heaven into hell to bring it to him, if anybody even wanted to. Okay, so some people think that you know hell's a fire, but other people think that it's a fire. But people just I don't know how long it takes, but they just burn up, and then for the rest of eternity they cease to exist, like the Jehovah's false witnesses. And that's what, you know, that's a false doctrine too. So if, if you're there in Mark 9, look at verse 43. And it says, And if thy hand offend thee, so Mark chapter 9, verse 43, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So there we see, the fire will never go out. But not only that, their worm dieth not. Okay, they're, they're, they're not going to die. That, that, actually, sorry, back up. They are dying. That's eternal death. So, but they don't cease to exist. They're eternally dying. It's eternal death. It's the second death. 
And if you keep reading here, verse 45, and if that foot offend, you cut it off, it is better for thee to enter a halt into light, life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend, thee, pluck it out, it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, and having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. You say, why does God repeat it three times? You wonder, sometimes in the Bible, he repeats it like two or three times something. And I think the reason is, is because he knew all these false prophets and false teachers would try to twist the Bible, and, and not only twist the actual Bible, but break their own versions. If you put it in so many times, it would be easier to detect. And not just that, it is an important doctrine. He wants to warn, warn people, it never stops. And the thing is, and then of course some people will twist this, this passage and say, well, you know, if you do something wrong, like you gotta pluck out your eye and then you go to heaven. No, that's not what this is talking about. This is saying, if there's anything stopping you from believing, get rid of that in your life. To give you pretty extreme examples, cut off your hand, cut off your foot, cut, pluck out your eye. If anything's stopping you from believing, do it. because. It's going to be better to be like that and go into heaven than having your whole body and, and going to hell. But obviously this is not necessary. It's, it's a heart problem. It's a brain problem. You've got to put your pride aside and just believe that you deserve to go to hell and that Jesus, faith in Jesus is the only way. Not partly what you do, repenting of your sins or being baptized or living a good life. It's all just believe on Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says... In Acts 16, 31. So, Matthew 18, 8 says something similar. It says, Wherefore, if the hand or the foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast thee, them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Which brings me to my next point. The fire lasts forever. Hebrews 6, verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let's, let's go on to perfection, on, on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. In other words, starting repenting on trusting your own works. And a faith toward God. He's saying, like, leaving the basics, and we've got to go on a little further, of the doctrines of baptism, and of laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So he's saying... Hell is a basic doctrine. You guys should already know this. We should move on to stronger meat of the word. You should know that works can't save you. You should know that it's just faith towards God. You should know that baptism isn't going to save you, but you should do it. And, and he talks about the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are all basic doctrines that we should know. So eternal judgment. Eternal means forever. It's everlasting. It's a judgment that lasts forever, and there's no hope for those people in hell. Daniel 12, 12, or sorry, 12, 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So not only do these people have to suffer eternally, they're going to have this fire that hurts, that burns, they're going to be screaming, but they can have a lot of time to think about what they did wrong in their life, all the sins they committed, and they didn't listen to God. And they're going to have a lot of time thinking about when somebody wanted to give them the gospel and they slammed the door in their face. Or said, no, it's, you're, you're wrong. You've got to repent of your sins. Or you got to worship these idols or Mother Mary or whatever you got to do. They're going to have a lot of time to think about it. It's really sad. Like This, this is the reason why we need to go knock the doors and, and get people saved. So they're also going to suffer eternal shame and contempt along with their physical suffering. So, okay, so we know hell is real. We know that's an everlasting fire and judgment. But if it, it exists, if it really exists, where is it? Um, so turn to Ezekiel 31, please. While you're going there, I'll read from you uh, Proverbs 15:24. So you're going to Ezekiel 31. I'm reading from Proverbs 15. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. So right there, it's simple. Hell is beneath us. It's, the Bible makes it clear. And there's just oodles of scriptures telling you that. Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. Malchia for which are exalted unto heaven shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So hell is down. Amos 9, 2. Though they dig into hell, then shall mine 
can take them, though they climb up to heaven, thence will it bring them down. So e even science teaches us, you know, when you're, I don't know how soon they teach you in school, but probably in elementary school, they teach you that the earth is however many thousands of miles in diameter, there's a thin crust, but in the middle there's like molten plasma or whatever they call it. They know that the center of earth is hot. So even science teaches there's a hell, but they just don't call it hell, and they don't teach you that people are, are going there if they don't believe in Jesus. So if you're there in Ezekiel 31, look at verse 14. And this is talking about, uh, Ezekiel is talk, is got some uh, prophecy about Pharaoh and Egypt. And it says here in verse 14, To the end that none of all the trees by the water exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men. Nether means lower, it's the low parts. Verse 15, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when he went down to the grave, I caused the morning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof. And the great waters were stated, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees in the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, when I cast them down to hell with them, the descendants of the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water, shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with them, unto them that be slain, with the sword, and they that were his arm, that dwelt under a shadow in the midst of the heathen. Now just drop down to uh, chapter, or verse 17 of the next chapter, 32 verse 17. It says, it came to pass also in the twelfth year. So this other one was, was in the eleventh year, I think it was in the third month. And this, this one is the word of the Lord comes to him in the twelfth uh, year, in the fifteenth day of the month. So it came to pass also in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down, even her, and the daughters of the famous nations, unto the nether parts of the earth, with them that go down into the pit. Whom dost thou pass in beauty? Go down, and be laid with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell, with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Ashur is there, and all her company. His graves are about him. All of them slain, fallen by the sword. Whose graves are set in the sides of the pit, and her company is round about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. There is Elam and all her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down and circumcised into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. I mean, you just see here, over and over again, down, nether, down. 25, they have set her a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. There again we see shame in, in being in hell. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. There is Meshach, Tubal, and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though they caused their terror in the land of the living, and they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war, and they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquity shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. So they were a terror in the land of the living, but here, they're, they're not a terror anymore. They're screaming just like anybody else. Yeah, though thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and shalt lie with them that are slain with the sword. There's Edom, her kings, and all her princes, which with their might are laid by them that were slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised, and go with them that go down to the pit. There be the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Sidonians, which are gone down with the slain, and their terror, they are ashamed of their might, and they lie uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword, and bear the shame with them that go down to the pit. So they're going down to hell, they're going down the pit, the nether parts of the world, of the earth, it's just, it just, over and over and over, it, it's talking about going down. So hell isn't some place in a far off universe somewhere, or some imaginary place, it's, it's in the center of the earth. Okay, if you... Go ahead and turn to uh, number 16. Number 16. 
Um, and I'll just read a few more for you while you're going there, just to reinforce this. Ezekiel 26.20 says, When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit, where the people of old times sh shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living. It's talking about descending in the low parts of the earth. Psalm 39, 30 verse 9. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall I declare thy truth? Psalm 55, 23. But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live with half their days, but I will trust in thee. Ezekiel 28, 8. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and I shall die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. So you see over and over, it's down. And just like I was saying, even science teaches us that, and I've heard, heard this example before, that an apple peel, that represents the earth, the apple represents the earth, and the peel is a crust. That, in, in a ratio, is actually thicker when, than what the crust of the earth is. So if you're there in number 16, look at verse 28. Number 16, verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. So, th this is a story about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They, uh, they thought Moses was taking too much authority, and they, they wanted to have some part of that. Um, and, and he's rebuking them and, and telling them that God sent them to do all these works. So verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. So he's saying, here's, here's how you're going to know that they have provoked the Lord, and that I'm right. If, if they die the, the way that, that normal people die, then I'm not right. But if, if God makes a new thing, he, he splits the earth open, and they go down quick into the pit, which means quick means alive. They go down alive into the pit. And then you know that, that Moses was God's servant, and that he was the leader. Uh, verse 31, And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground of slave was clay asunder that was under them. So just as he's finished talking, boom, it happens. You know, God wanted to make sure that these people knew that Moses was their leader and that he was God's servant, God's friend. And the earth, earth opened, opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all the men that are appertained on Korah and all their goods, they and all that are appertained to them went down alive into the pit the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. So that makes it pretty easy to understand. If it, the earth opens and they go down, well then hell is down there somewhere. Pretty easy to understand if, if you believe the Bible. So you think that with all these millions and billions of people, like because the Bible says broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. So there's there's just few that are getting saved in, in comparison to the people that are, that are going to hell. So there's millions and billions of people going to hell. You think, well, eventually they're gonna run out of room down there, right? Well, actually, no, they don't run out of room. Proverbs 27, 20 says, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. But the Bible does talk about hell getting bigger. It enlarges itself. Uh, Isaiah 5, 14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and the glory in their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth, rejoiceth shall descend into it. So, this is not the Bible. But I sometimes think, when you, you hear about all these volcanoes nowadays, and they're erupting, is that hell making room for these people? I don't know, that's just a thought. It might, it might not be, but uh, you know, it could easily be, though. They're making room for more people in hell adding on a new wing. Um, and, and the Bible talks about a bottomless pit. And if you think about it, the center of the earth, well, that's where the gravity goes to. But once you get to the middle, there's no bottom anymore because it, it, it's just a hollow or it's just an open place where hell is. I don't know exactly how it is. It's, the Bible talks about mire. Maybe it is a plasma where there, but there's no rest there day or night. It's just, and, and there's just no bottom to it. It could be falling for all of eternity. Um, so, yeah, the Bible does talk about hell getting bigger. So let's just review what we've studied so far. So hell is real. It's an eternal fiery judgment. It's in the center of the earth. But next, why does hell exist? Why would God make such a place? If he's a loving God, why would he make a place to burn people? Like, 
that people would suffer eternal judgment. Isn't God just love? Well, yeah, he is love, but he's also just. The thing is, he didn't even make it for us. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, so this is talking about the great white throne judgment, saying to people on his left hand, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So it wasn't prepared for the people, it was prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil exalted himself, uh, actually turn to Isaiah 14. So the, the devil exalted himself against God, and God cast him and his angels down, and that's why hell was made. And actually, his angels were cast down, but the devil will be cast down later. Um, and God didn't want any people to go there. It was for the devil and his angels, and that's why hell was made. So I'll just read a few for you. Uh, scriptures for you before we get to Isaiah 14. So in 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. It's their own choice. He made it so easy. He said it's like drinking a glass of water. You know, he tells the woman at the well in John chapter 4, you know, the, the person that's going to drink of this water will never thirst again. It's not, you drink the water, and, oh, you went and killed somebody, or thought a bad thought, now you got to drink that water again, right? Or, first, before you drink the water, you got to go, you know, have some conviction, or, or repent of your sins. No, it's just drink a glass of water, it's eat a piece of bread, it's walk through a door. How simple can salvation be? He made it so easy, it's a gift of God. Only thing you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And... So a loving God made it easy to escape hell, but there's people that their pride gets in their way and they, they don't believe on Jesus. 2 Peter 2 verse 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So there you see, the, the angels got cast down to hell. Jude 1 6, The angels which kept not their first estate, state, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, like we were saying, hell was originally prepared for the devil and his angels, but people sinned, and they didn't use the free gift of salvation that was offered to them. But then there's another thing a lot of people are mixed up in is they think the devil is reigning in hell. He's down there. So when new fresh batch of people come down there, the everyday people are dying, there's this porky pig Satan with a pitchfork, and he just ha 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 poking them. No, the devil's not even there and he's not going to rule in, in hell when he is there. He's going to suffer like everybody else. So if you're there, Isaiah 14, 12, this is talking about the devil. This is also talking about the king of Babylon, but it's talking about the devil. And often in, in the Bible, it has a main meaning and a second meaning, a prophetic meaning. So, in verse 12 there, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did sweep in the nations? And this verse right there, if you're ever talking to somebody and explaining to them um, why their Bible is wrong, if they're not a King James Bible, um, this is actually in their Bibles, a lot of them it's changed to the morning star. And we know that Jesus is called the morning star. And this wasn't part of my, my outline here. I'll just see if I can quickly find it. I think it's Revelation uh, is it 21 or 2, 22. If you find it, just shut it up to me. You may find it. Anyway, like I said, it wasn't in my notes, but it, it calls Jesus the most the morning star in, in Revelation. If you find it, uh, you can show it to me after. Um, okay, so we were there in Isaiah 14, verse 12, uh, verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the height of the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms? So once those people in hell are going to see Satan, they say, well, Is that the guy that actually caused all this trouble? Like he doesn't look like much. You know, like he's not going to be some mighty, mighty person. He's going to like, you're just going to look at him narrowly and like. Wow, this is the guy. Um, but notice in verse 14, though, it says, uh, sorry, not verse 14, verse 15, it says, Thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So the devil is not in hell right now. In fact, um, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walked about seeking whom he may devour. So the devil right now, he's walking around trying to find out who he can devour. He's going to try to get people mixed up with the Jehovah's False Witness cult before we get to them or somebody else gets to them with the gospel or get them mixed in the Mormon cult or the Catholic cult or any of these false religions. It doesn't matter. But actually, there are some that, that are even harder to get them out of. If you got a Muslim or, or you got a Jehovah's False Witness or, or if you got a Mormon, those are cults that are hard to get people saved out of because they, they've just been indoctrinated so much over and over. Whereas if it's just a Catholic, yeah, if they actually went to their church, they might get some indoctrination, but it, it, most of them don't even go to church, which is good. Because it's better not to go to church than to, to get your head filled with all these false ideas, you know, like that Mary somehow is telling God what to do and all these weird things. So, yeah, the devil's still walking around seeking whom we devour. But he's also working on us Christians. He wants us to get out of church. He wants us to, to not go so winning. You know, like, why don't you just you know, go home, take it easy, instead of going out and knocking doors. People make fun of you. People slam the doors in your face. Why should you go? You know, like, he's working on, on Christians, too, because he, he knows he's lost the battle. He's not going to get us to go to hell with him. But he wants us to, to quit saving people from hell. So, when does the devil go to hell, though, if he's not there now? Let's turn to Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20. 22, 16, okay, yeah, I'll just read for you then. Yeah. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So if, if Jesus is calling himself the bright and morning star, and if in Isaiah 14, 12, in these false Bible versions, perversions, they're saying, um, instead of son of the morning, O Lucifer, son of the morning, they're saying, O Lucifer, morning star. Well, they're doing what, what God accused Satan of, wanting to be like the most high. They're saying Satan is the most high because he's the bright and morning star, just a wicked false doctrine. Thanks for finding that. So if you're there in Revelation 20, look at verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Well, that must be the devil, right? He's ruling and reigning in hell, right? He's got the keys? No. Listen to what it says here. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So if, if that was Satan, he wouldn't be taking Satan by the tail and, and you know, throwing him into into hell and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed this little season so we see there and i will actually just keep reading a couple more verses and i saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of jesus and for the word of god which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So we see here that Satan was cast into hell, but when is it? It's after Armageddon, because in verse nine, or chapter 19, you read about the battle of Armageddon. And then you also read here in verse 4, about um, thrones and judgments and uh, what happens to the pe people that did not worship the beast uh, nor his image or, or take the mark on the forehead they lived with Christ a thousand years but wait a minute 
Doesn't the rapture happen before the tribulation? How could these people be here in the first resurrection that didn't take the mark, they didn't, take, they didn't worship the beast, how could they be here at the first resurrection? That should be the second resurrection then. Oh, well, I guess the pre-tribulation rapture isn't true after all. So the people, they got to live with Christ a thousand years. So this is before the millennium. Satan is cast into hell. He's bound there for a thousand years. So he is stuck in there till towards the end, at the end of the millennium. And then he tries to deceive people and he does. And then people come fight against, against Jesus. And at least in that battle, we don't have to do anything. Jesus will do all the fighting for us. We can just watch the destruction. It's going to be great. Turn to Zechariah 9. So that's the last place we'll get you to turn. Zechariah chapter 9. So the devil was never in charge of hell, and he's not in charge of hell now. He's not even there. He's, he's trying to still cause trouble here. He's the accuser of the brethren. He tries to accuse us. Well, I go to Zechariah chapter 9. Read for you. Revelation 1, 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus has the keys of hell and death. He is the one in control. And he's already decided who's going to hell. Not like the Calvinists say he picks, yeah, he, yeah, you go to hell, you go to heaven, 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 hell, 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 heaven. No, it's not like that. He's decided whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? It, it, in John 5, 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That means they already have it. And shall not come into condemnation. They will, there's no way they can go to hell, but have to pass from death unto life. So they already have their place in heaven. And so that's how he chooses. The people that believe, they have to go to heaven. The people that don't believe, they go to hell. The people that believe, he's not going to mention our sins to us. But the ones that don't believe, they're going to be judged by their sins, and they're going to go to hell. Zechariah 9, uh, if you're there, uh, look at verse 9. Yeah, no, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation. Lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. So, you read the pit where there is no water, and hell has no water, it's a pit. And how do people get out of there? Verse 9, King cometh unto thee is just in having salvation, it's through Jesus. Jesus is the only name whereby we must be saved, and it's the only way people are going to get out of hell. And yeah, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty tough sermon. It's a pretty strong meat of the word. It's a, it's I sh shouldn't say that it's a strong meat. It's a basic doctrine, but it's a heavy it's a heavy doctrine because we feel bad that people are going to hell. But the good news is we can do something about it. Jesus paid the price. All we have to do is tell people, and they decide whether or not they believe. So we are happy for our salvation. We're glad that we escaped hell. So now we should also take that. Knowing that the hell is real, it's a burning place, we should with urgency go and knock on people's door and say, you know, do you know for sure, and, and give them the gospel if they want to hear. And if they don't want to hear, just move on. There's somebody down the road that wants to hear. And, you know, because if, if we don't give somebody the gospel, they might never hear a clear gospel presentation. They're still without excuse because they have the knowledge. God has showed it on to them. You know, you can even see by, by nature that there is a God, and, and people have heard about Jesus. There's no excuse, but if we can give them a clear gospel presentation, if they're willing to listen, they, they, they might believe it and, and get saved. Just like if we saw somebody, their clothes are on fire. We're just going to walk past, and, you know, that's okay, that's them. No, we say, hey, your clothes are on fire. Oh, okay, thanks. And, you know, obviously, if it was to a point where they could feel it, they would know that, but, uh, you know, if it's just starting, they wouldn't. Um... And same thing if somebody's house is burning. Hey, your house is burning. Get out of there. We're not just going to walk past and leave them. Hey, that's his business. Well, you know, who cares? No, we're going to, just like that, we're going to warn them if, if they're on their way to hell, which is basically everybody that we meet. Unless they're saved. And if they are, are saved, good. You're my brother. You know, nice to meet you. But if you're not, you know, believe the gospel and you can get out of hell. Let's pray.